Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Matters of Faith, coming to you today from Cambridge. We're here at the Muslim College, where we're going to be speaking to the Dean of the College, Dr. Abdul Hakim Murad. He is a scholar in traditional Islamic thought, as well as an expert in, on Western thought and civilization, and has written many, many articles on Islamic matters, and is also a very popular speaker on Islamic topics. And Abdul Hakim Murad has just published a new translation of the very famous poem, The Burda, the poem of the cloak. And we'll be talking about that in a minute. But may I ask you to introduce yourself in your own words? There's a lot more to say to your career. <laughs> Uh, well, you've, you've summed up most of the interesting bits, I think. Um, uh, essentially, this is the, uh, the incipient Muslim college here in Cambridge. Uh, I also teach in the sort of in more mainstream uh, institutions as well uh, in the University of Cambridge. Um, uh, I give the chutzpah, the Friday sermon at, at the mosque here and some, some other places. I thunder at my congregations regularly in a vain attempt to make them see sense. Um, I have a wife and three children, uh, and th this translation of the Borde is, is my latest offering. In fact, it just reached me yesterday, so it, it's literally almost hot from the press. It came, <laughs> from, came from Turkey uh, yes, yesterday afternoon. Um, but I published uh, some, some other things as well, mostly on fairly recondite issues of, of Islamic law and uh, uh, European British Muslim identity interfaith dialogue, that kind of thing. So. Uh, before we talk about the Qasida Burda, let's talk a little bit about the Qasida in general so we mm -hmm. understand what it's all about. Could you explain to us the meaning of Qasida? Right, Qasida is an ancient Arabic word. It uh, precedes Islam itself, its origins lost in the mists of time, and it was about the only significant cultural production of the Arabs before the rise of Islam. They didn't have architecture, they didn't have calligraphy, they didn't have anything, but they did have their language, and the pride of their language was these very long odes which they would uh, hear around the campfire uh, late at night when they had nothing to do but hear these wonderful sonorous evocations of the desert, the lost maiden, the wanderer, the camel, the beautiful horses, the search for the encampment, ancient Bedouin themes. Uh, and the Qasida survived the transition into Islam and suddenly, as with all other things, started to bear fruit and blossoms and became an extraordinary vehicle for the conveying not of uh, ancient tribal humanism but of the new monotheistic message. So where previously the nostalgia of the Qasida was the poet standing by the embers of his beloved's campfire wondering where she's gone out into the wilderness, this becomes a metaphor for the lost human soul who has lost God and wants to know where is the beloved, where is Layla, where is my celestial betrothed somewhere out there. Now I have to become religious, which is precisely the quest for the lost beloved. So a very ancient pagan romantic theme really becomes one of the great sacred metaphors of Islamic civilization. So the Qasida doesn't just survive and flourish in Arabic, but it becomes a major um, poetic form and has subforms in other Islamic literatures as well. And people are still writing Qasidas to this day. Are these the main topics, uh, the lost soul, yearning for God, or are there other um, topics that Qasidas are written well, about? The classical Qasida, and there are said to be seven of them that were so esteemed by the Arabs that they were actually hung on the Kaaba, the, the, the great sanctuary in, in, in Mecca. Uh, the classical theme of it essentially is uh, loss, a sense of bewilderment, a sense that one is uh, in the hands of fate, that uh, one was united with one's people, one's tribe, one's homeland, um, uh, one's beloved, and then somehow it's all lost and one is just wandering in a solitary way in the desert or perhaps on some beautiful camel or horse that he spends a long time, time describing. So it is very much about union and then loss and then towards the end, sometimes you get, he finds the tent, the beloved is in it, uh, he's reunited with her, which of course in Islam then becomes the great metaphor of the rediscovery of the divine beloved, the union with the divine, and becomes a very explicitly um, a sacred metaphor. Uh, but essentially those are the basic themes, the theme of union and then loss, being lost, and then perhaps finding or being found again at the end of the poem. Beautiful. Now, um, Qasidas are often enhanced by music, and the poetry in general is enhanced by music. What musical style does the Qasida have, if it has any particular Well, style? Arabic is strictly metrical poetry, as well as rhyming, and that necessarily opens up the doors to the natural musicality of the language. It's not the case with an English poem, 
particularly modern English poem, that you can see it and immediately you can think of ten tunes that it would really go with. Um, uh, with Latin poetry, to some extent, which was strongly metrical, you could do that. With the decasyllables of Shakespeare, for instance, you can do that. With Milton, you can do that. With modern poetry, where you have blank verse and the idea of rhythm, of the power of the language recurrently reawakening the sensibilities as you go through each line. Um, modernity has lost that, and so we don't really sing poems any longer. We just hear the poet reciting. But in traditional civilizations, and not just Islamic, but um, classical civilization, Greek poetry, Chinese, there wasn't really a boundary between poetry and music. So the sonority and the musicality of the language, you just had to uh, make a slight modulation in what you were doing before it would become a kind of chant. And sometimes even the rhythms of Arabic go particularly well with the rhythm of the horse or the camel as you're going through the desert and it's really boring and you've got nothing to do other than recite all the poetry you know and listen to other people doing that. And there's even forms of poetry which is specifically there in order to make the camel go faster or slower. It's, it's very integrated into, into the natural world. And those rhythms give it a tremendous musicality. Uh, so uh, the, the origins of Islamic music really are in uh, Arabic poetry, and particularly the Qasida, as well as also being in its more refined forms in this formal cantillation, the tajweed of the Quran, which is the basis of Islamic uh, melodics and, and, and musicality. Would you say that uh, the Qasidas, this uh, kind of Islamic poetry, actually strengthens the faith, can help strengthen our faith? Yes, it, it, because we know that we are, as human beings, very susceptible to our environment. If we're in a beautiful building, we may behave differently than if we're in some car park covered in graffiti. Yeah. This, if we wear beautiful, dignified clothes, our behavior tends to be more courteous and dignified and restrained than if we're wearing a t-shirt and, and jeans and nobody expects anything of us. We're, we're very weak and vulnerable to our immediate environment. So when we hear speech that isn't just rapping, for instance, but is something that's transcendently beautiful with the full possibilities of the miracle of human speech with its endless permutations of adjectives, nouns, verbs, adverbs, uh, we feel that we are in our best modality, that our lowest modality is the sort of instinctual, uh, inarticulate cry of anger or when somebody steps on our toe we scream and it's, it's the lowest noise that we make. Poetry and the recitation of scripture and great literature is the highest sound that we can make. And when we move up to that, then our inward state is transformed and we become open to higher realities. So if you hear a beautiful poem, just as if you hear a beautiful piece of mu music, but somehow it's particularly the case with the spoken word, your soul is open to reception of, 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 of higher truths. Well, uh, the prophet had a great appreciation of beauty. Uh, there was a famous hadith that he says uh, God is beautiful and he loves beauty and uh, the prophet appreciated beauty also in the eloquence of poetry. Could you give us some examples for this? The issue of poetry is interesting because as with music it can possess us in a way that sometimes can be idolatrous. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with a very catchy tune for instance it kind of takes you over. You go to sleep and the tune's in your head. You wake up next morning and you're still thinking of the tune. And that's not spiritually terribly healthy. And similarly, you can become totally intoxicated by words and by a poem that, that takes you away from what those words are actually directing you to. So there, there have to be limits. And Islamic civilization ultimately is a religion of, of saho, of sobriety. It's about a kind of festive dignity, as somebody described. The Muslim is a person of festive dignity. He's always cheerful and enjoying life, but he's dignified. And the way he dresses and the way he is is sober. He doesn't overstep the boundaries. Um, but uh, the concept of, of verse in Islamic civilization is that it is that great mediator between ordinary factual discourse and saying things that describe the world and uttering things that uh, are about the unutterable and the ineffable. It forms a kind of bridge. Uh, and that's why the, the content of God's speech itself has that kind of musicality. And why tajweed, the formal recitation of, of God's word, to somebody who hasn't heard it before, they say, that's amazing music. I do this with my students sometimes. 
they don't know what they're about to hear, are coming to the, the lecture and just put on some Moroccan or somebody reciting the Quran and immediately you see their body language change, they stop messing around, they've no idea what it is, um, but the impact of the word has that effect, even if they can't understand a word of it. And poetry, real sacred poetry, can have that, that, that impact. It's not wahi, it's not revelation, it's the product of human composition. But nonetheless, it can make us shape up in that, that extraordinary sacred way, which is what Imam Bosiri was doing, doing in, this, in, this, in this poem. But of course, each poem has a different purpose. Imam Bosiri's purpose is the particularly high one of inspiring us with love for the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's the greatness of the poem. Um, but there's other poetry which is about particular saints or about holy cities or about practices in Islam or about repentance or about the love of God and if you read Attar, Sana'i, Fuzuli, all of the great poets of Islam you'll see they all have their particular preference. Bosiri's great love was, was the Holy Prophet and he produced this culmination of our literature. Um, but it's such a versatile medium that just about any religious sensitivity, this poem's about hellfire for instance, some of the great Uzbek poets write mainly about hell, and it's kind of scary, and you get into a state of constriction. But that was their maqam, that was where they were. Wow, um, fascinating. That, that, that's the power of the word. And I will talk more about all of that right after the break, and also the prophet, his reaction to the Jahiliya poet who came to him to seek forgiveness and to praise him. Stay tuned to Matters of Faith. We'll see you again right after the break. <laughs> 